Okay. I want to um, begin a new series on one of my favorite books of all time, which is Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, um, which was a book that came out in 1872, and it was his first book. And he was only 24 years old when he wrote it. Uh, and indeed, he was the youngest professor, and I still think to this day, the youngest professor uh, at the University of Basel in Switzerland ever to have been given tenure. He hadn't even finished his PhD uh, at that point. Um, so it was quite extraordinary. So he went in as a philologist. Uh, he had been thinking of science, uh, but then he thought better of it, uh, fortunately, and went in as a philologist, a uh, very young professor. He was there for almost 10 years, I think something like nine years, except with the interim that um, when the Franco-Prussian War happened in 1870 and 71, he went into that war as an ambulance driver, um, saw some combat, I'm sure, probably came out with some PTSD. Um, so now there are a couple of prerequisites here for understanding where um, Nietzsche is coming from. And I think probably these prerequisites were one of the reasons why his colleagues did not like the book. Um, they generally shunned it. And um, the prerequisites are uh, you, you need to know Schopenhauer, um, but you can't understand Schopenhauer without having read Kant. Or uh, also with Schopenhauer, the Upanishads. Because what Schopenhauer does is he takes the Upanishads and Kant and synthesizes them together to create his own philosophy, which Nietzsche then presupposes behind what he's doing here. Um, so we have to pause a moment on this introductory video and go over some of these guys. So we start with Immanuel Kant uh, with the Critique of Pure Reason. I think that's 1781, if I remember correct, uh, when it came out. Um, and Kant's insight is that um, the human mind brings with it the forms of space, time, uh, and the categories of the understanding, Verstand. The categories of the understanding are quantity, quality, relation, and modality, which I suppose he's inherited those from Aristotle. Um, and he says that the human mind, the most important of those by far, as Schopenhauer will point out, point out is causality. Um, so we have the transcendental, what he calls the transcendental aesthetic of space, time, uh, aesthetic because it has to do with the senses, and then uh, the categories of the understanding, which are presupposed by the human brain in its ability to make causal sense out of everything that it encounters in the phenomenal world. So this is the structure of the human intellect. This is what it brings with it to experience a priori. But, so, um, we're sort of prisoners inside of our brains, uh, Kant is saying, because we can't get at things as they are out there, in and of themselves as they really are. The dingan zish, the thing in itself. Uh, what we see is a phenomenal world spread out in space-time and organized by our brain. Uh, but behind that phenomenal world is a noumenal world. And noumena means not phenomenal. Um, and it's a noumenal world that we, we don't know and can never know because we only, we're stuck with... The, the functioning of the human brain, it's built and designed a certain way, uh, and there's no way of getting around it. It's just the pure reason. Um, so that's the, in a nutshell, that's the very short version of what Kant is, is talking about. Um, now, Schopenhauer read Kant, and then he read the Upanishads, which had just been recently translated by, I think, Anquetil du Perron, a Frenchman, and um, anyway, it wasn't even that great of a translation. But he read them, and the basic idea of the Upanishads is that the world is Maya. <clears throat> Maya now, Schopenhauer realized, is the same thing as what Kant was talking about as the phenomenal world of space-time and causality. Maya is the realm of illusion, but it is also the realm of space and time. And it's, uh, it's a kind of a trick, because it too is concealing a noumenal world, and the noumenal world in this case is Brahman. Brahman comes from the root bur, meaning energy. So behind the world of Maya is this mysterious cosmic oversoul, this Brahman thing, that on the inside, the, the microcosmic equivalent is the Atman, which is the same basic thing, and the two are one and the same. So the goal is to realize through the practice of yoga 
that uh, Brahmatman uh, are fused together through that practice. And Schopenhauer realized, um, okay, these are equivalent ideas then. The, the phenomenal world of Maya is concealing the noumenal world of things in themselves, which the Hindus uh, qualify as Brahman. So far, so good. <clears throat> so now Schopenhauer comes up with his philosophy. First, he writes a short book. Um, he writes a little book on colors. Um, he was a bit of a friend of Goethe's, a uh, huge admirer of Goethe. Um, Goethe was a bit of a mentor, and uh, but he wrote a... You know, Goethe wrote a famous book about color theory, and Schopenhauer took issue with him. And I don't think that Goethe liked that. But he did like this book, The Fourfold Root of the Principle of Sufficient Reason, uh, which is basically an examination of the principle of sufficient reason that has to do with, uh, it's sort of his version of the Kantian categories, um, the way the mind understands the world a priori through a principle of reason of willing, a principle of reason of the become, uh, of becoming, and another one that I've forgotten at the moment. Uh, but it's a fourfold. It, there's, there's four different types. Then he writes, um, um, I think this is 1818, and he writes, uh, The World as Will and Representation, also sometimes translated as The World as Will and Idea. I think representation is a little more accurate because idea um, gets tangled up with platonic ideas as well as just simple human ideas. Um, in a way, Schopenhauer does mean both. But what he does then is to say that the world itself, Kant was correct, um, but he didn't need all these other categories of quantity, equality, relation, and modality. The only categories that matter are space, time, and causality. Because as far as Schopenhauer is concerned, yeah, even animals have this. Even animals have a pre uh, built structure, to, uh, an ability to understand their world. Um, he says, I open my drapes and my poodle looks up and knows exactly what I've just done. I can tell by the fact that he's got a basic causal mechanism in there that, that knows what just happened. So animals have this too. The only thing that humans have, according to Schopenhauer, that animals don't is the faculty of Vernunft, which is also inherited from Kant and the German tradition, but changed it completely. You know, Vernunft for uh, Fernand is to be con contrasted with Verstand, for uh, Verstand ha is the understanding, uh, the basic uh, cognitive intellect of the categories. Fernand, on the other hand, has to do with the ideas of the reason, and these are ideas with a capital I. Uh, he's talking about the platonic forms, he's talking about big ideas, the transcendental signifieds, God, freedom, immortality. And according to Kant, those ideas are necessary for conferring synthetic unity on the manifold of the entire cosmos. We, we need a sense of completion, a cosmic world image, in other words. Schopenhauer says, no, we have Verstand, and animals have Verstand, uh, the space time and causality, and what fair enough is, is just simply the human faculty for abstracting concepts. We, can, we have language, and we're able to ab abstract concepts from the flow of significations. So he changes it a bit here. So this is the world as representation. Um, this is the world uh, that corresponds precisely to Maya and to Kant's phenomenal world. Uh, but then in the semiotic slot that would correspond to Brahman in the Upanishads and to thing in itself in Kant, he puts this idea of will. Um, Schopenhauer is the first of these great German idealist thinkers. Uh, there was a slew of them, of course, Kant and Hegel, uh, Fichte and Schelling. Then we get to Schopenhauer, and he's in the same tradition, but quite a bit different. Um, he's the first of them not to believe in God, for instance. Um, and instead of God, he has this idea of a cosmic will, that simply the thing in itself, and what the Hindus mean by Brahman, is a cosmic will that brings everything into being. And it drives matter. It drives electricity, <coughs> magnetism, gravity. It's a fundamental force. The sex drive uh, comes out of it. Um, it's a fundamental force. And this is the inner interior noumenal world. Um, I, I can know myself as a willing being because I'm always willing things. I'm always desiring things. I'm always wanting to do things. Um, so that is the, the set of equivalences that Nietzsche has inherited. Uh, and, of course, also 
Wagner's music, which he, he was a friend of Wagner, the Wagner's, uh, Ricard and Cosima, and uh, he, he was a friend of them, a big fan of Wagner. And this book is written, uh, the second half of it is written as a celebration of Wagner's operas. One other note is that uh, he has taken from J.J. Uh, Bakafin, um, who wrote a book called Mother Right, and it's the first book to suspect that beneath the patriarchal pantheon of the Olympian gods lay, must lie, lie an earlier stratum of matriarchy, of uh, goddess worship. And he divided history into these three distinct phases of the uh, Aphroditic Hetiric phase, uh, where the, it was sexual promiscuity was the rule, um, and he analogized this to kind of a swamp. It's just a swamp-like sense of sexuality. Then that declines um, into the Dionysian, what he calls the Dionysian order, uh, which are orgies that are a, a, a declension from that. But then the matriarchy comes in and brings in the institution of marriage with Hera, the goddess Hera. So the middle period, each one of these epochs corresponds to a different god or goddess. So Hera brings in the goddess of marriage, brings in that institution and stabilizes society with monogamy and marriage. Um, that declines and there's a revolt by the Amazons who have been sick of being abused by men. So they form an order and then the Romans come along and bring in the Apollonian world of reason, rationality, law. Um, and Bhagavan says that a lot of the wars uh, that the Romans had uh, were with goddess-worshipping societies like the Sabines and the uh, Carthaginians. That's not an accident. Bakufin says that they were all fighting against societies in which the goddess was the primary icon. Um, so Nietzsche has taken from Bakufin the terms of Apollo and Dionysus and borrowed them and re-territorialized them in a different sense. Um, okay, so the original title of the book uh, is The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music. And I think it's a better title than he later changed it to The Birth of Tragedy or Hellenism and Pessimism. I think that was a mistake. And I think what I want to do, I want to do this chapter by chapter, but I'm going to skip his opening attempt at a self-criticism because he wrote this later on and basically disavowed the book as a, wor a work of romantic youth. I think that was a total mistake. I think it's his best book. Um, he may even have come to the realization that that was a mistake to disavow it. Um, so the birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music. So the first thing he starts off with, there's a little preface to Richard Wagner, kind of an, an acknowledgement to, to Wagner, uh, where he says, we shall have gained much for the science of aesthetics once we perceive not merely by logical inference, but with the immediate certainty of vision that the continuous development of art is bound up with the Apollinean, here it's translated as Apollinian, uh, and Dionysian duality. Um, these are the two most powerful gods, and they both personify different things. And he says, first, let's, let me interject here in the second paragraph the analogy between two different types of natural phenomena that uh, correspond to these two gods. Dreaming, which corresponds to Apollo, since Apollo is the god of forms and the making of forms, on the one hand, an intoxication. On the other, Dionysus, of course, is the god of wine and boundary dissolution. So we have these two uh, naturally occurring uh, phenomena in us, um, dreaming and intoxication. And um, he mentions Schopenhauer right from the start. And what he's going to do is to, again, analogize these two concepts with the semiotic slots that we've already been over. Apollo will correspond to the phenomenal world of Kant, Maya, the veil of illusion in the Upanishads, and with Schopenhauer, uh, the world is representation. That's all Apollo's realm, the god of restraint, the sun god, uh, the god of form and luminosity. And opposed to that will be the darker, deeper god, Dionysus, which will correspond to Brahman in the Upanishads, thing in itself in the Kantian system, and to Schopenhauer's will. So 
Apollo and Dionysus, he makes those. So we've got a system of equivalences here. I used to take notes in college, and I would draw these maps. And it's really helpful to do, to, to find the equivalences. Um, okay, and so he says that um, the Dionysian, um, in the second chapter, um, he contrasts the Dionysian with the Apollinian by saying that um, there's two different types of Dion Dionysian uh, ecstasy. There's the Dionysian Greek, who was a civilized individual, and they had festivals, um, but the Dionysian barbarians, which he calls almost everybody else, the, the Babylonians uh, and so forth, their Dionysian festivals were orgies with sexual licentiousness, and he regarded that he regards that here as barbaric. It was the Greeks, he says in this second chapter, that really um, restrained the Dionysian. And in particular, the two of these became balanced in their creation of tragedy. So the birth of tragedy does indeed come out of the spirit of music, because these are also two different types of music. Apoll Apollinian music is the cithara, the, the stringed instrument, whereas Dionysian music uh, has, to, has to do with uh, harmony and melody and rhythm. Uh, it would correspond exactly to rock and roll and popular music um, versus, let's say, classical. Classical music is Apollinian. Rock and roll is Dionysian. So that's what he does. Um, and he's going to say, um, we'll anticipate a bit here, he's going to say that um, when those two principles, as aesthetic principles, um, there's the principle of the beautiful on the one hand, the aesthetic principle of the beautiful, uh, which is something that you see that is pleasing to the senses, uh, as Joyce defines it in Portrait of the Artist of the, uh, as a Young Man, um, that is beautiful, which, when seen, pleases. On the other hand, we have the sublime. So we also have, uh, back, way back behind this, Kant wrote an essay on the, on the beautiful and the sublime and the differences between them. And here again, we have the same two semiotic slots. The sublime has to do with the apprehension of great power, either enormous expansion of space or uh, a prodigious power, like a nuclear bomb or something would be sublime. Um, so what the Greeks did was they created tragedy uh, with these two aesthetic principles perfectly in balance. And he'll say that the principle of the Apollinian, uh, the god of form and dream, uh, corresponds to the character, the main characters, whoever it's about. Let's say it's uh, Oedipus, Oedipus Rex. Uh, Oedipus is the Apollonian principle there, but in between that we get the chorus. Every now and then the chorus will come in and sing us a dithyram, a song. That's the Dionysian principle, the collective principle, the will principle versus the dreaming principle, the principle of unity, of intoxication, the boundary dissolution of the Dionysian. Um, it's supra-rational, whereas the Apollonian is rationalism par excellence. So what he's going to say is when those two were in perfect balance with Aeschylus and Sophocles, you had the creation of one of the greatest art forms ever invented, Greek tragedy. And then he'll say it declines uh, with Euripides, who starts to begin to dispense with the Dionysian principle. He eventually gets rid of the chorus, um, and he begins to rationalize the myths. And this will lead then to a very important discussion uh, that had a huge influence on Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West. This book lies back behind Decline of the West, just as these other thinkers lie behind the birth of tragedy, uh, in that um, Euripides was a friend of Socrates, and Nietzsche will then invent his concept of the Socratic man. Spengler didn't invent that, Nietzsche did, um, and it comes from this book. And what happens when the Socratic man poisons civilization poisons well poisons culture poisons art forms by sterilizing them away with rationalism and that's what euripides starts to do so the whole thing will come crashing down with euripides writing plays under the influence of socrates bringing in the principle of reason and losing touch with the numinous mysteries there's a sacredness a sacrality still about the plays of aeschylus and sophocles they're still very much in touch with what Heidegger would call being. Um, I suppose you could say that uh, with the place of Euripides, Heidegger would say 
these plays are uh, beings abandoned by being. They're no longer in touch with being. Um, and so this will lead to the decline of Greek tragedy into, um, there's the new comedy with Aristophanes, and then after that, some pretty banal stuff uh, with Menander, I think. And it just becomes totally banal, like, like bad television shows. And so that's the theory, and it leads Spangler um, into this idea, of, well, it's not just art forms that, that decline as rationalism comes on stage. It's entire civilizations that are disturbed and uh, uh, disequilibrated by the rise of rationalism, which begins to sterilize all the mysteries. It gets rid of religion. It makes this pretense that, of athe that atheism is correct, which it absolutely is not. It's dead wrong. Uh, but it's a fad that comes out of this um, Euripidean, Socratic man uh, and the rise on stage of the Enlightenment, uh, which will correspond, in our case, as far as Spengler is concerned, uh, the Enlightenment will correspond with uh, Euripides in the period of Socrates um, coming on stage. And this will lead to, basically, this is one of the most important books uh, for an influence on Spengler, and it's the first book, really, Nietzsche is really the first um, sort of philosopher to begin having an instinct for decadent culture forms and for analyzing when a culture form has become decadent, when it has departed from its original inspiration and gradually become semantically depleted over time. Nietzsche is the first sort of philosopher um, to, to have an instinct for decadent culture forms. So he, he's very important in the history of philosophy for that reason. Um, so we'll leave it here with uh, the introduction to The Birth of Tragedy.